persecution of joy and hope. So in Revelation 3.20 we find this. Behold, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So when we look at this, eating is a very intimate act. You're giving something permission to come into you and become part of you. And what a better way for Christ to represent to us of his body and his blood is to come in and dine with us and that's with him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these tokens that you've given us. Simple things to remember that sacrifice that we cannot lose hold because you are always with us. We do this to reaffirm what you've done. We do this in remembrance of you, not of us. Remembering the great sacrifice, the love that enveloped so much that we can't even comprehend your love for each of us. Those who aren't even here, those in the world, you still love them and hope that they find their way home. We ask you at this time, we pray for those people. They seek you, they find you. And I ask you most of all, forgive us for falling short constantly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so grateful that we that we are able to share in the Lord's Supper. It seems like things have separated us so much. <coughs> so many times we don't want to even touch or be around. And I'm not criticizing anyone there at all, but it's a matter of this is what's there. And yet this is the one thing, this is the one part of the worship that really brings us close to one another because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made of his own life, that God has made of his son. I love it when he simply says, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often you eat it, do so in remembrance of took the cup. He said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Drink of it, all of you. I 
I'm, I'm grateful for the attendance for everything that we have here uh, this morning. I, I really want to make an explanation I, because a couple of you have asked me about this and I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass the Stewart family at all. But as you notice that uh, Matt and Lindsay and, and the children are not here and I can understand the, the feelings and, and everything that this family has. They are going to, uh, is it Lahart, David? Yeah. They're attending the church in Lahart. Number one, that is much closer, but number two is because of the closeness of young people that their children can be involved with and can share with. I'm going to ask that we really keep them, Matt and Lindsay, in, in our prayers and the children. But also, you know, we've got to fill those two pews there <laughs> some way. I mean, when we had those 10 that are here every Sunday, it, it was always something that, that enlivened me uh, to see them and, and to feel them a, a part of, of the worship service. So let's keep, keep that in your prayers, if you would, also, that, that we are able to reach out uh, and, and really uh, find somebody to fill those pews. <laughs> um, for our prayers this morning, uh, I have two prayer requests that have been given to us. One is prayers for Dwayne Collins. Uh, he's undergoing stem cells transplant uh, for cancer. And also his wife, Janet Collins, is having knee surgery. The difficulties that, that one faces uh, as we become older, are just they're, they're great, aren't they? And each one of us, I think, can, can share that uh, so easily. And also, let's uh, uh, keep sharing uh, in our prayers as well. She still needs uh, our prayers. I would be great for us to do that. Are there any other prayer requests uh, that you have this morning? I know you didn't write them down, but is there a prayer request? I really want us to keep our nation in prayer. Uh, the things that are taking place uh, within our country. Yes, Sean. Yes, yeah, Sean. Oh, I'm sorry. About Sean. His daughter had cancer and they made it to uh, she has two months in months in her breast. We hope we pray for some cancer. Okay, what's her name? Cindy. Cindy. Okay, we'll keep Cindy in our prayers also. I really want us to keep our country in prayer, the days that are ahead, and that we will be able to remain strong as individuals. We're gonna ask that we have just a moment of silent prayer, and then I will leave. Our eternal God and Father, we thank you for the love that you have given to us. We thank you for the direction that you have, that you have let, put in front of us, that we are able to follow the directions that you have given. Today, as we look even around our community, we ask that you will watch over and care for the farmers that have produced so much in corn and beans and, and cattle and, and all of these things. And we just ask, Father, that you will bless them, that you'll protect them, that they will be safe as they harvest. We thank you, Father, for the way that you have shown such beautiful days as we look at the changes that are taking place in, in what you have created. We look at the leaves as they're so beautiful. And yet when we, we see what has happened with the fall and, and with winter coming, we pray, Father, that some way we will prepare ourselves for the winter of our life. I pray, Father, for all of the members of, of our church. I thank you for their support and their blessing, for their faithfulness. In this time, it is so hard to sometimes even have our own devotions and to have our own prayer. 
We pray, Father, that you will know our hearts and our minds. Please bless those that have been put before you. That their needs will be met. That there will be peace. There will be comfort. There will be strength. I ask also, Father, for your presence today as, as I bring this message. May it be one that each one of us can take to heart and find strength in. I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. <coughs> I, the message that I have this morning may be a little different than, than anything that you have heard or, or will hear me uh, preach, but one of the reasons is because I'm not the one that wrote it. <laughs> uh, but it's a message that I received uh, some time ago when they, when we were in the process of uh, really planning to add to the, the building and, at Southwest Christian Church in, in Ocala, uh, we had a, a contractor by the name of, of Donnie. And Donnie was such a, a, just a very strong Christian man, and they're members of the, of the Southland Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky, one of the largest of our Christian churches in the country, they have between three and 5,000 on Sunday morning. And uh, I, I don't know how they're doing now, but uh, they, they are always good. And, and when the building program that we were facing, it was a, it was a large program, it was one, to be $1.8 million that we were going to be adding to, to the church building in, at Southwest. And, and we had to kind of withdraw a little bit because of a number of circumstances, the other things that were taking place. But the way we did that, Donnie, Donnie Tucker sent me a couple of books, uh, and one of them happened to be a, a list or a book of, of special sermons that Wayne Smith, I don't know whether any of you have ever heard of Wayne Smith or not, but really one of the greatest ministers in the Christian churches and churches of Christ, and uh, just a, a, a good man, and just kind of a common person, I think like I feel I am. And... Uh, I, I looked through this and I found one especially that Donnie had laid out or had kind of pointed to me that he felt like might be something that I would like to, to think about. And it was. I mean, and it's simply this one that says, pray to hurt. Now, it doesn't mean that you're faking it or something like that, but it, it kind of goes along with one, one special idea that, that is involved in this. And it's one that, that Wayne had preached almost every year since 1963. And he always preached it just at the time of the Super Bowl. And when you think about it, that's why the word playing hurt was. And he's talking about this. He's saying, and thankfully, he had some really good examples. There were men that were members of his congregation that are professional football players, that they had been a part of church there and they had spoken quite quite often and in fact as, uh, as he delivered this one sermon on a particular day he said that there were three of the Super Bowl players that were there in the congregation that morning along with one of the referees by the name of Tommy Bell and all of the things were taking place and, and as he was talking about this, this sermon and about the things he was he was using the football players as examples. And as Tommy Bell, the referee, was talking, he was kind of a short fellow, he said, but he told all of his stories about things that had happened and all of the challenges that the players had, had uh, faced within their lives. And he talked about some players that had been playing for, you know, for many, many, many years. And in fact, as he was talking about a one particular player, Joe Namath, all of us know that name, I think, but Joe Namath had played for over 3,000 games in his lifetime, and he was still playing. He had, he had broken his arms, he had broken fingers, he had banged up knees, he had concussions and everything, and he said, he said, Tommy Bell asked me, you know, why are you doing this? And he just said, because I love football. I love to do it. And as he was talking about all of these people, and finally he came down to, 
to one example. It's about this particular game that uh, that Val was happened happened to be the uh, the referee for one of the judges, and he said all of a sudden one of the players hit another one head on just like that, and his eye popped out of the socket. And they were so astounded. Said all of the millions of people that had been watching these didn't know what had happened or what was going on. And they said it wasn't really such a tragedy because they realized he had an artificial eye. <laughs> and so they, they, they bent down and they picked it up and they washed it off and put it in his, put it back in his eye. And he said, Tommy Bell uh, kind of looked at this player and he said, you know, you only have the sight in, in one eye. Why are you doing this? You know, what would happen if you lost your other eye, if you couldn't see? And the player just looked at Tommy Bell and said, well, then I would become a referee. <laughs> and and you, you think about, about these little things that, that there are, the, the challenges that, that we face in life, and all of the, the little things that are there. And you know, this is really the thing that I think that we are facing within Christianity, the challenges that are made uh, to the church and the challenges that we face as individuals. And Wayne says, and I want to read it, he says, I gave birth to a tradition at Southland in preaching this sermon each year on Super Bowl Sunday. And he says, I, I, I wanted to do it because they were playing hurt. And he was pointing out something that I believe is really taking place in our world now. And it's something that also we as individuals are. Aren't we playing hurt in so many areas? I mean, when we think about, about each of us and the things that we are facing within our life, physical needs, the pains that we have, we are playing hurt. Now, in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, and I'm going to read three verses. There are verses 1, 8, and 9. And I want you to see what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he's talking to the people at Corinth. He says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. And then we look down and we look at, at verse 8. And we I'll be looking at this, it says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed or perplexed, but not in despair. And you see what there is here. And in verse nine, then he goes on and, you see, and he simply makes the, the statement, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And you think of what he's talking about and what he is saying here and how it kind of fits in with this idea of, of the Super Bowl and, and football and, and the little things that, that we face uh, within our lives. And as we look at this, it's something that does apply to us as individuals. And we see what happens to us. In a sense, we're in the game of life, aren't we? And in the book of Romans, we have other passages of scripture that I'll be that I'll be quoting uh, this morning. And out of these, and we begin to see things happening. And it's there are ideas that are that are really predicted in the scripture as to our lives. And I, I think as I as I deliver this sermon to you uh, this morning, it's what's happening. It's happening within our society, within our world. And the sad thing is, even within the church. And Wayne Smith said, this was my most requested sermon. And he preached it every year. Now, I, I remember hearing this as he preached it in the North American Christian Convention a number of years ago. I believe it was in, in 1993. And that's been a long time, I know. But he preached his sermon on that time. And one of the reasons that he was doing this was because of the things that were happening uh, within the church, because ministers and individuals were, were misunderstood. And, and the thing that was happening, in fact, is the prediction that he gave, he said over 1,300 ministers a year are being fired or are dropping out of the ministry because of discouragement. And he was talking also about the church leaders and what, was, what the challenges 
that they were facing as, as individuals. And he, says, he points this out, in the last 25 years, divorce has increased in the parsonage. The average length of ministry in a Christian church is a little less than three years. And when you look at this, of how significant it is, because you know as well as I do. Now, I, I know I'm, I'm new. I know, I, believe it or not, I've been here nine months already. Uh, but you stop and think, what really makes a strong church is when a minister can be there for a longer period than three years, or two years, or, or nine months. And things can begin to change. I mean, we can be really close to one another if all of these things can come together. And how difficult. And in a sense, we are playing hurt, aren't we? As far as Christianity is concerned, the pains, the struggles, the things that are challenging us uh, within our lives. And it all, all really kind of boils down to this. Whether you're on the football field or whether you're in the kitchen, no matter where you happen to be or in your office, you're going to be hurt. I, I, I want you to understand that. All of us are going to be hurt. And there are going to be times when we say, I don't know what to do. I'm going to give up. Have any of you ever felt that way? I, I, just, I just want to quit. I want to give up. And as we look at what God is talking to us here as far as uh, the gospel, as far as uh, Corinthians and Romans and really the Bible in itself, we see that He's challenging us and saying, don't give up. Don't quit. And in fact, if, you know, he says, being, in fact, here we find these words. It says, kind of said, stay in the game. The man who puts his hand in the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And isn't this kind of the tendency that we have? And, you know, as a congregation, I'll point out one thing that I have noticed. You know, one of the first times that I was here, which was last year, when I first came, there were 89 people in attendance that day. Now, that was great. And the thing we have a tendency to do that I look back at, I look back and say, you know, why don't we have 80 people now? What's happening? Why? And this can become something for a minister and you as leaders and as a congregation itself. We can become kind of discouraged and say, what, what's happening? And then I look at other churches and I see the challenges that, are fa that they're facing. And here's what the scriptures: He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And think about this. No matter how big we are, no matter how small, the work that we do, and I'm talk, not talking about me, I'm talking about you. The things that you do are not in vain. The prayers, the opportunities that we have, they are so strong and, and so important. And the, really, the big question I think that we are facing because of the criticism and the statement I heard on television last night of one of the great preachers uh, in our country uh, as he was making this statement, saying the church is necessary. It is one of the necessary things. And yet for some reason what's happened is saying, well, it is not necessary. It is not important. So you, so you don't really need to be there at all. And the question really to us is this, are we going to stay in the game? Are we going to keep at it, regardless of the opposition, regardless of what? You know, that's the proposition that I want to get to you this morning. And I, I guess in a way I'm making the proposition to, to myself as well. Are we going to stay in the game? God had one son. You stop and think about it. God had one son without sin. But he had one son that was full of sorrow also. And you think of how easy it would have been for Jesus, for the disciples and so on, to have given up. And so we find these scriptures that we find here in Corinthians. I want to read them again. Therefore, seeing we have the ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed 
but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. And think of what this means to us as a Christian and as the Christian world. And what's Paul, what Paul is simply saying is this, I'm down, but I'm not out. We've been knocked down a little bit. We're not out. We're going to continue to work and so on. And in the book of Romans, chapter 8, we find so many things. Now, in, from verse 35 uh, on, we find so many statements that are made. But I'll back up just a couple of verses. In verse 28, uh, he says, All things, and all of you know this, and you could almost quote it for me, but all things, what? Work together to good to them who love the Lord what that means uh, to each other. If I, you know, frankly, if I didn't believe that as a man, as Dave Campbell, as the ministry, and, and, and Mitzi, and so on, I'd have given up. I'd have gone a long time ago because there were things physically that I had to go through, you know, three or four knee surgeries, back surgeries, arm surgery, depression, all of these things. I would have given up a long time ago, but you stop and think, even these bad things that are happening, even the negative stuff that is going on in the world, he said, all, now listen, all things work together for good, what? To those who love the Lord. So important, isn't it? All of these things, the losses that we've experienced, the feelings that we have within ourselves and, and what it means. You know, we're in the middle of a, a heartache as, as an individual. It's hard to see how, how these will be blessed, isn't it? When you're going through difficult times within you, you know, when you're in the middle of an illness. And you know, we have many of our people that are in the middle of an illness. And they, they can't hear. They can't see. They can't feel. They can't even be here. And, and yet you stop and think about it. He says, even this is what is going to bring a blessing to us as individuals. That's when he says, put it on me. And in a way, that's what Christ was saying. Go ahead, put it on me. And in my son, put, put it on me. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. All of these things that are happening. And there are three things that I really want to bring out uh, to you this morning. And I'll do it quickly, but here, the first of these, we must learn to play when we're hurt physically. I want you to think about what took place in the life of the Apostle Paul. And here's the word, and here, here, here's the statement. Five times received 40 stripes, five times beaten, three times with a rod, once I was stoned, three times shipwrecked, I was in weariness and hungry and cold. And then here's the statement that he made. I was given a thorn, therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm shipwrecked, if I'm beaten, if I'm kicked around, if I'm criticized, maybe you're not like that, but I, I'd say, nuts with you. You know, that's, that's too bad. I'm, I'm leaving. And we've done, I think, in some sense, as the church and of Christianity, men and women, we've done that. We're at a point where we don't, we won't even say anything to another person. And we've all had that challenge, haven't we? In some way or another, if it's a parent, if it's a child, if it's a friend. And in fact, it was kind of interesting. Even last night, Mitzi, Mitzi mentioned we had a we had a thing uh, with our part of our family uh, down along the Spoon River. We, uh, the kids have kind of named this spot on the farm as Picnic Point. Well, we had this fire and we had all of this stuff. And there's one of our children here that doesn't agree with us in, in some of the things politically. And you know what? I didn't want to talk to him about it. I didn't want to bring it up, but I did. It didn't please him, but I did. And I think it changed some of his ideas. And the same thing is, is in every aspect, in, in everything that's taking place within the community. And Bruce, I'm, I'm sorry. 
I don't mean to be picking on you all the time, but Bruce probably has one of the most difficult jobs of anybody that I know in being head of the of the shelters in, in Macomb and the people that he is dealing with. And I imagine sometimes, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, but sometimes you want to say, I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm just going to do what you want me to do. I'm just going to do it the way you want to do it. Nuts with you. I'll just do it. Or even like, what in the world am I doing here? I quit. And isn't this the place that we are in as far as Christianity and the church is concerned? Well, we can't even talk about a life in Jesus Christ. We can't talk about morality. We can't talk about all of the challenges that we face as Christians because we're afraid. We're afraid that somebody's going to criticize us or they're not going to disagree with us. And yet, look at what Paul and all of these men went through within their lives and what was happening to them. Wayne Smith gives this illustration. He says, Lou Gehrig played first base for the New York Yankees for 15 years. He was called the Iron Man of baseball. What is important is that he played 2,130 games without missing a game. Every time they had a game, he played. And then he goes on and says, that's like a minister being in the pulpit. And he's talking about himself, Wayne Smith, in the pulpit for 51 years, never being ill, never going to the hospital. I mean, it's just unbelievable that you had that you feel great every Sunday morning. When he retired, when we finally Lou Greg retired, he x-rayed his hands and every finger had been broken once, some twice, and some three times, but he never missed a game. What did he do? He played when he was hurt. Have any of you ever had your feelings hurt? Have any of you ever been injured where you, where you just didn't want to do anything anymore? I know all, I'm I'm sure all of us had, if nothing else, when we were a young person, we wanted to just give up and, and quit. And the thing is, Satan is going to continue to injure, to hurt, to attack the church, and to attack you and me in every possible way with one hope, that is, that we will quit, that we won't talk about our relationship to Christ anymore. So this physical thing is important for us, no matter what happens. And as we become older, it's more difficult, isn't it? To do the things that we, would, we have done that we would really like to do. Even, even in singing, you stop and think, I can't sing any better than I ever did. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't answer that yet. <laughs> you say, well, you don't. You know, don't sing too hot now, so why, why would you be concerned? But you, there are other things like this that, that happen, and even, even in the ministry, there, there are things that I can't do that I used to do, but I'm not going to give up, and I want you to know that. And it's one of my phrases that I use uh, so often that Mitzi kind of gets on me, and I said, you know, I, I'm not going to quit, so don't get your hopes up. Uh, you, you look at this, and, and you're not either. We're going to continue to make progress. The Bible says, don't grow weary in well-doing. And why, why did he say this? I think he said it because he knew we would. He knew that that was a possibility, that we would give up. And the second thing, after the physical, is the our faithfulness be measured by the depth of our love. It's easy to not love some people, frankly, isn't it? To just say nuts with you. Forget that. I don't know where I got that term. I've already used it three or four times today. <laughs> uh, maybe that's what we had in, at the picnic last night with a bunch of nuts. <laughs> but here, you see, as, as we look at it, the question I want to ask you is how much do you love? How, how much do you love? That's how, that's how, as we look at it, how long we're going to stay in the game. And that was the challenge that Tommy Bell was always talking about, the Wayne Smith was talking about. They asked me, you know, why did you do this? I mean, you've been injured all of these times. And here was this one player that was in a wheelchair, had been injured so badly that he couldn't even move. And he said, you know, why did you do this? 
And the answer was, it's because I love the game. Why do we stay in a marriage? Why do we hang on to our kids? Why do we stay faithful as, as individuals in the church of Jesus Christ? And I want to tell you simply this, because I love him. Why am I here? Why are you here? Because I love you. I want you to know that love more than anything else as we see it. The Bible talks about this so often, how important love really is. And in U.S. News and World Report, a number of years ago, there was an article about a, about a little girl that was seven or eight years old. And her father had fallen into the swimming pool and, and knocked himself out. And this little girl, seven-year-old girl, got in there and held him up until he could be rescued and saved his life. And somebody simply uh, asked her, how did you do that? And here was her question, here was the answer. Oh, it was easy. I love my daddy. How can we do this in our world? Because I love you and because this is the statement, this is the condition that we find within our lives as husbands and wives and moms and dads. Why are we doing this? Why do we rescue? You know, I've, I've had friends that have taken a child out of prison a half a dozen times. I'm not sure I could have done that. Did you ask them, why did you do that? Because I love my son. Why is God, why did God give us Jesus Christ? And we could simply say, because I love you. Because I want you to, to know him. When the church, as we look at it, has that kind of love. When we as men and women, that kind of love for each other and for the Lord, then our potential is unbelievable. It's something that, that is so great. And we don't know what else could happen with it. You know, you know, we live in, in an interesting place. And I, you know, I lived, I raised on a farm and I, I saw tractor pulls and I saw horse pulls. You remember when you used to have horse pulls? Uh, and and I, I remember one time particularly, uh, here was this team of horses, and somebody said, Well, this one, this one can pull uh, eight thousand pounds, and then the other one could pull 9,000 pounds. Well, the question is, how much could they pull together? You say, well, you know, average it out, they could have got this many pounds. But in reality, here was the answer. They could pull over 28,000 pounds together. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I would, you want to say, well, what can I do? And you may look at me and say, well, what can he do? Alone, I'll say, I can pull 8,000 pounds. But when I'm with you, when we are together, we can pull 28,000 pounds. We can do more than anybody could ever expect if we're doing it together. It's called uh, the great idea of synergism, of working and pulling together. If we try to do it alone, then we're not going to be able to make it. And I want to, in a sense, I, I'm not hitting you for this, but I'll say, if you expect me to do it alone, then I want you to know it won't happen. But when we're doing it together, this church, because of our love for Jesus Christ, will be the strongest thing you have ever seen. And we will be able to do it together. When we're in this for the king, for the long haul, and our motive is love, then our possibilities are amazing because the church is pulling together. And if we try to do it alone, we're lost. And it's, listen to this one. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people think. I don't want God to someday say to Dave Campbell, and this was a quote from Wayne Smith, you quit on me. I don't want God to ever be able to say that. And I don't want him to be able to say it about you either, that you quit on me. 
It bothers other people when we say, you know, things that I don't like about you, about the ministry and things like that. That always bothers me. I, I, my feelings get hurt just like everybody else. Maybe I'm giving too much about me this morning, but think about what this is and what it means. You know, all of a sudden, you know, it's this, this statement that is made, salvation is free. Isn't that great? But it's not cheap. It costs us something. It costs us something within our lives. We're not saved by works. I'm not saved by the number of calls that I make or the number of sermon and all of the things like that. God wants us in the game. We are saved for works. We are saved to be able to accomplish and do what he's asked us and challenged us to do. The next thing is simply this. Suffering is inevitable. Ministry, misery is optional. It will come to you one way or other in some form, and you either play hurt or you don't play at all. And that's where we are. That's where we are. And I, as I look at the election, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you think I'm being too, too political. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. But I know that no matter what happens, we as Christians cannot give up. We must not give up. We must continue to preach and to teach and so on. And all of these things. A little story that is it's kind of interesting that, that I see uh, in this and the whole uh, sense that is taking place is how, how we are together and we find strength in, in our ego, in, in our philosophy and in all of the things that are taking place place within our lives mentally. There was a, a story that was told about an, an individual, a fellow by the name of John Blanchard, and I'm going to read part of this as I go along, but John Blanchard, he was stationed in Florida during the, during the Second World War. One evening he wandered off into the library and he found a, a book, you know, on the station that, that he really liked, and, and there were notes in it, and all of a sudden he found something in there, and he, and he said, it looked like a woman. Uh, a woman's writing, you know, guys, their writing is different than ours. Uh, they don't scribble like we do. But he, he saw these really little items in this book, and finally he, he saw her name, a name of a woman in there. And he, he started, he was so impressed by the notes that she had put on there that he started looking at her, and he found her. He found that she lived in New York. And so he... He wrote her, and they corresponded for a while, and then he was shipped overseas, and then he came back and he decided, I'm going to meet this woman. And he said, he, he asked her, send, send me a picture of yourself. And she refused to do it. He said, boy, now what does that mean? But finally they, they arranged to meet at Grand Central Station. And the thing that was going to help them to identify one another was that she was going to be carrying a rose. And he was going to be carrying the book. He would be in a uniform. And so that day he was so excited that really we had fallen in love with one another as, as we had written all these letters to one another. And I just knew you know, the feeling that was there. And he, they were to meet at 7 o'clock on this Saturday evening. And so he is, there he is there in Grand Central Station with his uniform and his book. And all of a sudden here all come these, this flock of people. And here was this, this, he said, this beautiful woman in a green suit and beautiful shoes and dressed and her hair was blonde, her eyes were blue, just wonderful. And as, as she passed by, she said, how are you doing, soldier? And she just kept on going. He said, I, he said, well, I wanted to follow her. And then he looked and here was a woman carrying a rose, the rose that they had talked about. And he said, that she was a, a woman in her, in her late 40s, early 50s, and she was overweight, and she had on a hat that was pulled down over messy hair, and her shoes were too tight and, and didn't fit, and, and, and her eyes were so sad. And, and he said, I, and she was carrying the rose. He said, I didn't know what to do, but I knew what we had promised. And so he went up to her and introduced himself. And she just looked at him, and she said, you know, I don't know what you're talking about exactly, but that, that woman in the green suit up there, she gave me this rose. 
and told me, she said, if that, if a soldier asks you about that rose, said, tell him I will meet him at the restaurant across the street for dinner. If he asks you to go to dinner, then that's what I'll do. And you think about this. It's little things, how many important thing that he was faithful to what he said he would do to that woman. He said, I could be friends with her. Not really, not in love with her, but I will do what I promise. And as we look at this, how important it is uh, within our lives. And the question that this woman asked him was this. Did you pass the test? And isn't that the question that God is asking us now? Are you going to pass the test? How are we going to live? Jesus said, and here's the scripture. Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. No matter what's happening in the hurt that we face, Christianity is the name that we are under. And faithfulness is what he is asking us to do and to be. Heaven is in Christ, and heaven is home. And when we look at this, let us be faithful. Let's play hurt. We are hurt. Christianity has been hurt. Our church has been hurt. But you know what? We're going to play through it. And we're going to make it. We're going to be stronger than we ever thought we were going to be. I don't know how, but God does. And it means our faithfulness to him and where we are as his children and what it means. Our song to conclude the service this morning is one that I think is, is so significant for us. It's probably one of my favorite songs because of what we have to say and because of the way that the Lord approaches us and the decisions that we must make as, as individuals. And listen to what it says most softly and tenderly. Let's stand as we sing this. As we close, maybe you need to make a, a deeper commitment to Christ. Maybe you need to, in a sense, commit yourself to playing hurt. And we'll do that this morning. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling you, calling for you and for me. Sitting on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you. face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Sing beautifully. Yes. <laughs>